Hello, welcome to this walkthrough video. Uh, this video is aimed at, primarily aimed at my students of uh, research writing. Um, you were given a worksheet at home or in, in class to work on at home which has comprehension questions uh, relating to uh, a research article you were given entitled The Effects of Foreign Language Anxiety and Test Anxiety on Foreign Language Test Performance uh, by uh, Masume Saleh and Faima Marifat. Uh, okay, here are the answers to the questions that were posed in the worksheet. Uh, okay, so the first step to reading a scholarly article like this is to look at the main features of the article and decide whether the article is actually usable or relevant for your needs as a researcher. So the first thing we're going to look at is um, when the article was published and whether the data is current enough. Well, actually, if we skim to the end, we should see that information. Okay, so it was published in 2014. And the other thing we want to look at is uh, the journal or the um, periodical. Uh, and it was published in Theory and Practice in Language Studies, Volume 4, again in May of 2013, uh, 14. Is the data current enough? Well, yes. Um, it may be a bit dated, but uh, indeed this is still usable. Uh, if you are doing your research project on the topic of anxiety and uh, learner sport special needs for learners, uh, this would be a relevant article. Um, where was the research conducted? Okay, so we see that indeed the research was conducted at... I would imagine it's um, a university in Iran, right? Because it would be um, researchers are Iranian. Might this have some effect on whether the data is still usable for your research? Well, again, if your research is being conducted in the Netherlands, uh, probably Nordholland, Amsterdam, uh, and these surrounding areas, um, yeah, this is something to keep in mind that, you know, there are, of course, cultural differences and, um, yeah, just differences in uh, language learning between, for example, uh, Iran and the Netherlands. So, indeed, this will have some effect uh, on the considerations for your own research. Uh, who did the research? Who wrote the article? Well, we know that these are the author's names, and actually, Kind of cool if we scroll to the end of the article. Uh, here's a picture of our uh, researcher and author who has a bachelor's degree in English translation that she got from in Tehran in 2006. She got her MA in um, teaching English as a foreign language and now she's a PhD candidate um, and she's published articles and her current area of research is testing. Okay, so that gives us some perspective on, well, the background to the research itself. Uh, I'll point out as well that throughout this article, you'll see useful vocabulary highlighted in yellow. And at the end, we can go back and look at that because, again, for your own written research paper, uh, this kind of vocabulary is uh, very useful. First, we're going to look at the what's called the abstract. Now, this is where your summary writing superpowers come in handy. This is essentially a summary. Uh, and hey, let's check it out. How long is this article? Well, okay, it's 10 pages long. Um, that includes all the citations, the bibliography. So really, it's a little over eight pages long. Um, and then you see that the article, eight and a half pages, is essentially summarized in this one summary paragraph. Okay, which sentence describes, oops, sorry about that guys, describes, let's uh, correct that error, which sentence describes the objective and the target aim of the research? Well, logically, it's the very first couple of sentences. This study aimed at investigating the effects of foreign language anxiety and test anxiety on foreign language test performance. 
Another purpose of this study was to see whether there is any relationship between foreign language anxiety and test anxiety. So again, uh, you'll find the main aim right in the beginning, logically. Where does the author describe the methods that were used? Here we go. 200 students of English as a foreign language at pre-intermediate level participated in this study. Okay. Um, and which tools did they use? Which methods? Uh, in the present study, the foreign language classroom anxiety scale and the test anxiety scale were used to measure foreign language anxiety and test anxiety respectively. The scores obtained in each questionnaire were correlated with the student's final exam grades. Okay, so we know that they used these two uh, questionnaires and that that was the methodology used. In which part does the author describe the findings of the study? So indeed, what were the results? Um, both foreign language anxiety and test anxiety had a statistically significant negative correlation with the exam grade, suggesting that both types of anxiety have debilitative effects on test performance. Hmm. Okay, so not only have they presented their findings, but they've also presented some analysis. And where, in which portion of the abstract does the author make conclusions and then recommendations? Well, here's some analysis. Correlation uh, analyze, analyses indicated a strong positive relationship between foreign language anxiety and test anxiety. So indeed, according to their research, there is a connection, a relationship between uh, one's performance in a foreign language setting and one's test anxiety. Therefore, here comes the conclusion, English teachers, or actually this is the recommendation, therefore English teachers are recommended to try to reduce both language anxiety and test anxiety by creating a friendly and supportive atmosphere in class, encouraging students' involvement in class activities, and teaching some anxiety-reducing strategies to the students. Cool. Okay, we've made our way through the abstract. Now, let's look at the introduction. Here it comes. Uh, the first thing you see in the introduction is that the author presents background to the issue. You know, what is the problem? What are they looking at? What is the current state of affairs? Uh, you see the background in the beginning. As well, notice here that the first thing the author does is to define their terms. That is, they explain what certain terminology means so that we, the reader, understand what they're writing about. Um, here they refer to trait anxiety and state anxiety. Now again, we may not know what that means, so the author needs to explain it. What is trait anxiety? Well, trait anxiety is defined as a relatively stable tendency to ex exhibit anxiety in a large variety of circumstances. So it's kind of a character trait. Uh, so it's not specific to just when you're taking a test. It's general. And state anxiety then is defined as a situation-specific trait anxiety. That is, an individual suffering from state anxiety will manifest a stable tendency to exhibit anxiety, but only in certain situations. So it depends more on the state uh, of affairs. That is, what's the situation? So again, these are different because trait anxiety is more general that someone might experience frequently all the time. State anxiety is more situational. Now, in section one, Okay, let's look at section one. Where is it? There it is. What does the author claim is lacking in terms of the literature out there dealing with different types of anxiety? Well, the author writes, all these studies, and what studies is she referring to? All the existing studies that have been done up to now, or up to at least 2014. All these studies have focused on either foreign language anxiety or test anxiety. What is lacking in the literature is a study which investigates both of these types of anxiety and compares their effects on foreign language test performance. Aha! So she's making the claim that uh, 
this is uh, a, a void. There's not enough research or literature uh, on how both these types of anxiety might affect foreign language test performance. Uh, okay, and then in section two, the author further explains the purpose of this study that was conducted. What is the purpose? Why might it be unique or perhaps even groundbreaking? Well, the author writes, therefore, the purpose of the study is to investigate the effects of foreign language anxiety and test anxiety on foreign language test performance and to see which one is more effective in this concern. We also want to see whether there is any relationship between these two types of anxiety themselves. Okay, so now we have an even more clear idea as to what the study attempts to uh, <clears throat> look at. Uh, sorry guys, slight grammatical error. In section three, here we go, the author describes something called debilitative anxiety. What does this mean? Well, um, I think part of the problem here is that the author doesn't actually define these terms. However, we can make a guess if we look at a dictionary. The word debilitative or debilitate, the verb to debilitate, means to harm, hinder, have a negative impact on. Okay, so debilitative. That means it. if you have a debilitative anxiety, it harms or hurts your performance. In the same section, there is a mention of facilitative anxiety. So can, can we make an educated guess as to what facilitative means? If you think about the word facilitate, that means support, guide, make possible. So these are um, tegenwoorder, right? These are opposite terms. If something's debilitative, it hurts performance. If it's facilitative, it s helps. Uh, I think the author probably should have defined these terms, but in any case, uh, we can figure them out just on the basis of the language. In section four, the author points out that Horowitz et al. believe that language anxiety is distinct from general anxiety. Okay, so how do they define language anxiety? Well, they write, um, they, Horowitz et al., that's Horowitz, Horowitz, and Cope, defined language anxiety as a distinct complex of self-perceptions, beliefs, feelings, and behaviors related to classroom language learning arising from the uniqueness of the language learning processes. So why is it unique and different from general anxiety? Well, according to Horowitz, Horowitz and Cope, um, foreign language learning anxiety is specific to language learning. You know, it's not something you experience uh, in your own native language. Do you agree with this? A thought-provoking question rich for debate and discussion. Let's move on to section five. A very intriguing finding is described here. What is it? And why might this be of interest in your own research out there, viewers? Well, here they uh, put forth that uh, a large scale study of multilingual adults around the world, and this was uh, conducted in 2008, found that Individuals who were younger when they started learning a second or third language had lower levels of language anxiety. Well, that's interesting. Um, they also go on to mention lower anxiety levels and the knowledge of more language it correlates with higher levels of emotional intelligence. Okay, don't know if that's terribly interesting for us. Yeah, but here she states, the study suggests that in addition to individual characteristics, larger social circumstances, such as the availability of supportive conversational partners and second language, L2, role models, may have a role in reducing language anxiety. Well, this kind of stands to reason. If you have people out there who support you in your language learning process, this could reduce anxiety. Why might this be of interest? Well, because your own learners, uh, when you do your research, 
you know, it depends on how old they are, when they've started learning English, for example. Uh, do they have conversational partners out there to practice with or not? Further, in section A, the author describes another very thought-provoking finding in regards to gender. What is it? How might this be relevant for your own research? Well, this is quite interesting. They, that is Marcos Liñas and Garau, found that female students were less anxious than male ones. Um, hmm. Now again, in terms of your own research, this might be of interest to look at in the profile of who are you researching? Are they young men, women? Are they uh, non-binary? Um, gender seems in some studies to have a correlation or uh, an effect. Uh, in section 6b, the author claims that more research is needed in a certain area and why this research is important. Okay, what indeed is stated here? Well, uh, the researcher points out that <laughs> based on the inconclusive results obtained in previous studies, more research seems to be needed in this area. Moreover, it is worth comparing the effects of foreign language anxiety and test anxiety on foreign language test performance because it helps foreign language teachers, that's us, know which type of anxiety they should try to reduce more than the other. This study was conducted to fill this gap. So again, the researcher, this young woman, noticed a lack of information out there regarding um, you know, these two types of anxiety on test performance and conducted this study as a means of um, filling that gap in knowledge. Okay, and why might it be important? Well, because then we teachers know how to address the problem. If we can diagnose and understand why our students, our pupils, are anxious or, say, unwilling to speak or get upset during testing, uh, we can better figure out how to help them. Okay, uh, sorry guys, I'm just going to reduce this a bit. Okay, um, cool. We're going to move on to section 7. How might this be of interest to us as researchers? Well, let's take a look. In section 7, the author states, ah, both of the above-mentioned questionnaires, again, that's the test anxiety scale and the foreign language classroom anxiety scale, both of these questionnaires were translated into Persian. The reason for using the Persian, Persian translation was that the students were chosen from pre-intermediate levels of language proficiency, not advanced levels, and they might not have understood all the items in the questionnaires clearly if they read the original questionnaires. Um, yeah, but even if they were chosen from advanced levels, their lack of understanding of one or some of the items you know, would affect the results. So the questionnaires were translated. So indeed, this may be of interest to you all uh, because you may have chosen or you may choose um, to translate the questionnaires that you're going to use out there in your placement schools uh, to Dutch or Arabic, Spanish, uh, whichever language it is your learners uh, are fluent in. Read section 8. What is the purpose of this passage? What is the researcher admitting here and why is this important? Well, section 8 reads... There we see all the statistical data. Uh -huh. Before drawing any conclusions, some points should be noted. Due to its correlational design, this study is by no means perfect. In fact, blah, 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 was not possible. Therefore, the following conclusions are offered while admitting their shortcomings. What is this passage meant to uh, do? Well, the researcher is admitting the, the limitations to their study, that this is not a, a perfect or infallible study. Uh, the results can be considered reliable, but of course, as a researcher, you need to explain um, what any sort of 
limitations or problems might um, <laughs> limit or affect the analysis. And of course, in research, the idea being that someone else could duplicate the conditions and should thus get the same results. That's the scientific method. The researcher is admitting here that um, there were limitations that would affect whether someone else can reliably obtain the same results um, running their own study. Okay, in section 9, the author of the article draws a conclusion from the analysis of the research findings. Uh, what is the conclusion and what does she then recommend that teachers do? Well, in section 9 she writes, the findings of this study reveal that both language anxiety and test anxiety have a debilitative or harmful role in language learning, at least in settings similar to those in this study. So what we could probably assume through by common sense is indeed that if someone is, you know, nervous or anxious about performing in a foreign language and someone has uh, fall angst or test uh, fear of failure regarding tests, yeah, that's going to have a, a negative effect on their language learning. The thing is here, we can't just conclude it on the basis of common sense. We need research. Uh, to scientifically prove or indicate that indeed in such settings um, these results, our common sense ideas are valid. Okay, and what does she then um, go on to recommend that teachers do? Well, we, that is teachers, should take measures to reduce both types of anxiety. Teachers can be very influential in reducing learners' anxiety. Teachers need to reduce anxiety and enhance self-confidence by encouraging students' involvement in classroom activities and creating a comfortable atmosphere. Uh, and then she goes on to enumerate and list uh, different ways in which teachers can reduce anxiety in their classrooms. Okay, finally, what sort of research was conducted here? Was it qualitative? qualitative? or quantitative, quantitative. Um, well, if we just sort of skim through and look, you know, we have correlational coefficients. We've got a lot of statistics and um, sort of mathematics here. This is quantitative data. So they had 200 um, participants in this study. So this is not qualitative. It's not based on interviews. This is quantitative. It's based on a quantity of responses. Lastly, is the reference list done according to APA standard? Well, oops, sorry guys, let's not do that. Wrong icon, Beth. Um, is it APA standard? Well, no. Uh, you'll recognize, that is my students will see right off, uh, this is a different type of uh, referencing list. Of course, in our um, university, the University of Applied Science, we tend to go with APA, American Psychological Association um, referencing. Uh, that tends to be the standard in social sciences. Uh, here they've used a different type. Okay, no worries, as long as we acknowledge it and we don't duplicate this in our own uh, work. But what about the in-text referencing? If we look at the in-text citations and paraphrases and is this done according to APA? Yeah, more or less, this is what we're looking for in text. So in your own research papers, in your own introductions where you're including some theoretical understanding and you're going to be using secondary sources from articles, yeah, we're, we're expecting uh, this sort of uh, citational standard. All right, folks. I hope that has helped to give you a clear idea about how to go about um, extracting information and as well some useful vocabulary. Check the, the chunks in that are highlighted in yellow because um, this is a lovely way to learn from what you read and better understand the process not only of research but how to write about 
research in an effective and professional manner. Thanks for watching.